my happy role is to introduce uh, Clark Barrett, uh, who is a professor of anthropology at UCLA. Uh, and among the many functions that uh, he, uh, his cross-world uh, <laughs> work uh, uh, performs is that he's our secret agent. BBC CDs, uh, this weird uh, European society secret agent among the Shua at the Amazon. So <clears throat> for that he spent some half of the year every year in, uh, in uh, Brazil. And uh, uh, I should say that I am really happy because I have known Clark for, well, only for two decades. And we have been uh, colleagues and very good friends uh, during this time. One particular uh, interesting large multi-scale uh, uh, cross-cultural project that he's a key uh, member of has been that we were involved, both of us for the last 10, 15 years, I don't know, for a, a multi-site uh, investigation of uh, uh, natural pedagogy and its uh, debated universality versus just weird stuff kind of uh, position. Uh, among the theories, and uh, I hope very soon we will have this work published. But he has done uh, numerous other important uh, large projects where basically he has the unique expertise that is uh, uh, necessary for working at the happy crossroads of, uh, of uh, anthropology, cognitive science, cross-cultural uh, research, and uh, I would say uh, evolutionary psychology. So, uh, Wade Clark, I have just a few other things to say about you. Uh, so, he, well, currently, he is a co PI in the Geography of Philosophy project that, uh, uh, that is a large multi site uh, project to investigate uh, concepts of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Uh, around the uh, 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 cultures of the world. And uh, he is an editor of a, a two-volume uh, uh, work on indigenous epistemology, which uh, is, well, I understand it's greatly interesting. And uh, apart from that, he is a director of UCLA Center of Behavior, Evolution, and uh, Cognition. Uh, and he is president-elect of the Human Behavior and, Evolution, uh, and Evolution Society, which has upcoming conferences, and one of them in Europe, and he will uh, give the details about that for us. So uh, I try to you know, steal the majority of your talk time, but no, I stop now, and I give the uh, <laughs> possibility for him to explain all of this to us. Thanks, thank you, George, I really appreciate it. Um, and it's great to, to see many familiar faces here. Um, those of you who are at CEU Cognitive Science might know, um, I was here as a visiting professor in 2013, so it's a real pleasure to be back. It's a 10 year anniversary for me to be back in, in Budapest, and uh, it's great to see many familiar faces. Um, yeah, before I forget, uh, what George mentioned, Human Behavior and Evolution Society. I think there's a lot of overlap with um, many of the, the talks and presentations I've seen here, and I wanted to mention that um, I think, so the, the one this summer is in Palm Springs in California, which is a nice place to go, and the uh, call for abstracts is still open, but also we, we don't have it finalized, but it, um, the one next summer is going to be at uh, Aarhus University in Denmark, um, and so that's close enough to hear. Uh, hopefully some of you can come and present your work there because I think there's a lot of overlapping interests. So let me um, launch into my talk and uh, to begin with um, I'd like to thank you all for coming and um, thanks to Rachel and Esther for inviting me. Um, it's a real honor to be here and uh, 
I'm frankly a bit nervous to give this presentation in front of this audience for a couple of reasons. Um, this is a, the, there's some data that have been around for a while in this talk, but there's also some very new data um, that I don't yet know completely how to understand. And so, um, you know, I, I will say at the outset that I'm going to raise more questions than answers, which is part of my job as an anthropologist. So, uh, and the story that I'm going to tell has both positive and negative sides to it. There's a glass half full and a glass half empty component to what I'm, I'm going to say. Um, the glass half empty part is essentially that we don't know nearly as much as we should about um, the topic that I'm going to talk about, cognitive diversity and moral judgment. The glass half full part is that there's a lot left to do and there's people in this room who are might be well situated to answer some of the questions that I'm going to raise. So <clears throat> I'll probably get distracted. I may run out of time. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to give a few conclusions before I start. So things, some take home messages that are actually um, bigger picture things that I want to say about cross-cultural research. Okay, so I'm going to talk about morality and I'm going to talk about some, some specific data that we have from several of the projects that George mentioned. Um, but um, I also want to say a few things about um, the role of cross-cultural research in cognitive science. And I think it's safe to say that we're, uh, you know, again, glass half full. We're kind of in a, um, uh, Cross-cultural research is very popular right now in cognitive science. Um, there's a lot of large cross-cultural projects, including ones that I um, have participated in and, and am participating in. Um, and I think, I think that's good news. I think that's the way it should be. But I will say uh, that I think there's lots and lots of room for improvement. Um, and so I want to use some of the data and studies that I'm presenting here to draw some bigger conclusions about how we might improve cross-cultural research in cognitive science going forward. Um, so one thing that I'll say, and th there's going to be a few controversial claims here, uh, I, think it's, I think that most cognitive theory and research is about universals. That makes universals easy to find. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. One is if you uh, go into the forest looking for bears, um, that probably makes you more likely to find bears uh, than if you're looking for something else. So that seems relatively uncontroversial. I know that we're also, many of us here are worried about things like the so-called false positive problem in psychology right now, um, which means, you know, if to the extent that there's a concern there, it's that uh, when we look for something, we can design our methods in ways that actually make it more likely to find uh, what we're trying to find out. And um, so it's worth thinking about this. Um, and, and actually, I would say th the pessimism can be even worse that I think that even the theories of cultural and individual difference that we see in cognitive science right now are ultimately in a strange way universalistic because of the preference for grand theories. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, it's very popular to have certain kinds of like dimensions that we're looking for. So we'll study 10 or 15 or 20 different societies and then try to mash them all together along some kind of dimension like weird or non-weird or market integrated or non-market integrated or small scale versus large scale or collectivist versus individualist, or tight versus loose social norms. You know, all of those are interesting concepts, but in a strange way, those are kind of universalistic theories because they're trying to explain all variation, or they're trying to reduce lots of dimensions of variation into single explanatory factors. Um, and, I, and, and, you know, in some sense, this is good. This is what psychologists like to do, um, not so much what anthropologists like to do. Uh, what is the solution? How, how can we complexify things a little more? The problem is, you know, when you, when you try to do that, um, you end up exploding the space of possibilities. Um, the, the depressing part is that's kind of what we're going to have to do if we want to explain um, cultural diversity. And so I'll say a few words of that, about that as we go on. Um, so what this means is that the cognitive science of things like culture and contextual cognition, you know, how, co how our cognition varies according to like what's going on in the moment, are, in my view, depressingly underdeveloped. Um, we can measure lots of differences, but we can hardly explain any of them. Um, and I'll be giving you some, you know, case studies of that today, where we know that there's variation and it's difficult to explain. Um, I, I know that this is the, the, the primary focus of um, this particular meeting is cognitive development. And I will say that I'm not actually going to be giving 
you any data on um, child development of any kind. I'm going to be giving you data that's exclusively from adults. But I would say that to know what questions to ask about cognitive development, we need to know about the outcomes of development that we're trying to understand um, and not just the starting points, right? Um, and I, I, my impression is that that doesn't drive enough cognitive development research. Um, we look at the early stages of development to try to understand the starting points of development. There's a general understanding that all babies sort of start out equal potential, that all babies can become everything that humans can become. That has to be true. But um, we really should look at the diversity in uh, the outcomes of development in order to understand what might, at least part of developmental psychology has to be looking for the reasons why people in different places end up developing differently in, in addition to the ways in which we develop similarly across uh, cultures and environments. Um, another point that I'll make as an anthropologist is, you know, cognitive science has to engage with life actually lived, and I mean that both life lived outside the lab and beyond the phenomena theorized by psychologists. Um, you know, this might be obvious, but if you look at the work that's being done in cognitive development and cognitive science, um, it, it very much has the flavor of uh, coming up with the theories first and then, and then looking, for the, looking for the data to explain those theories and not looking to real life to try to understand uh, what cognition is for. And so I say this both as an anthropologist as an, as, and as an evolutionary psychologist. Um, it seems uncontroversial that the reason that the mind exists, the reason that the mental mechanisms that we're studying exist evolutionarily is because they're there because of life. They're, they're there in order for us to live our lives, right? And so when you look at a domain like morality, and we're gonna talk a little bit about, about what morality is, um, the mechanisms in our mind that deal with interpersonal relations, they've evolved because of the real world problems that we face. Um, and, you know, it may be that in cognitive development you need to look at um, Pac-Man creatures colliding with each other on a screen or something like that in order to understand what morality is for a baby, right? But ultimately we do need to understand, we need to match that up to um, the moral problems that we face in real life. And some of them, as we know, and I'm gonna mention a little bit about this, um, you know, are incredibly difficult. And if we think about the political situations that we're in in the world right now, things that anthropologists think about, how do you map from infant research about morality into what's happening in the political scene in Europe and the United States and around the world, right? Where is the connection there? There has to be one. Um, and so this is a way of saying some of our research needs to take these phenomena that we know are important and then project them back into development and see how do we get there from these starting states that developmental psychologists study? And I think anthropology can help to do this. And um, <clears throat> another point that I try to make is that to explain and understand humans, we need all humans. And I mean this in both, I mean this in two senses. Um, we're in in, in um, cognitive science, because of um, things like uh, Henrik et al's weird paper in 2010 and other kinds of calls to increase the diversity of research participants in cognitive science, we're already on the road to understanding that cognitive science needs to study a broader range of human beings in order to be able to draw conclusions about humanity. Um, we're not there yet. I'm, I'm that, my talk is not really gonna be about that, but I do have, um, you, you can look, I do have some papers in which I do some analyses of, the, of that problem um, bibliometrically and so on, that, that we're still not even close to, to, to solving that problem. But there's another representation problem that isn't discussed nearly as much, which is who is doing the research? And if you look around at this room, um, there's a diversity of people here that are doing this research, but it is not representative of the diversity of all human beings. And there's a question that um, we should ask is how would cognitive science change if we actually included more people as researchers from different perspectives. And I'll be saying a few things about that as I go on. And that, that to me is important. George uh, mentioned the volumes that I'm doing on indigenous epistemologies um, in which you know, we're actually looking to ideas about knowledge, wisdom, and understanding in indigenous communities, particularly I'm looking in, at communities in the Andes and Amazon in South America, um, not just as sources of data about how the mind works, but there can also, those, 
there's ideas there that are sources of theory about how the mind works that we're not yet really um, incorporating into cognitive science. Um, and, there's, and we don't know how cognitive science would be different if we did that. It's a whole other, a whole other topic and a whole other talk. Um, but when those, you know, keep an eye out for those books. And, and one of the things that we're trying to do in those books is specifically look at how you know, things like, like philosophical views of what knowledge is can be challenged by indigenous perspectives um, on knowledge. And I think cognitive science can also be expanded if we expand our point of views about where theories come from. Um, so I'll say a few things, a few notes before I begin just about me and um, the, the projects that I'm gonna talk about. So um, I work at UCLA. This is a um, part of the research team that I have at UCLA, students and, and postdocs. Um, and I also do work in indigenous communities in South America. Um, so this here on the right um, is a workshop that my student Ulysses, that's Ulysses Espinosa, and I organized on um, indigenous knowledge and indi indigenous attitudes towards things like the, the, the ownership of knowledge um, in Shuar, Achuar, and Shivir communities in Ecuador and South America. And we started a working group called Ayinsu Nekaiteri, which means uh, human knowledge, the human knowledge working group. And here again, it's possible to actually collaborate with people in communities outside of formal academic uh, perspectives in order to actually expand how we theorize about what knowledge is. I won't be saying too much about that, but I think the reason I want to mention that is I think that that is a cutting edge for cognitive science to pursue in the future. And some of the data I'm going to be talking about, some of it comes from the Culture and the Mind Project, which George was mentioning and he participated in, which was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK. We're st these projects take so long to come to fruition that we still have data and papers that haven't come out from that. And then the current one that's just wrapping up is called the Geography of Philosophy Project. I'm one of the PIs, Edward Mashery at the University of Pittsburgh and Steve Stitch at Rutgers University are the other PIs. And we're using experimental philosophy methods at different sites around the world to try to look at um, concepts of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. So I'll be talking about some of those data today. Um, so the reason I'm mentioning this is that, you know, my perspective as, as, as a researcher, as an anthropologist, is informed um, both by what I've learned from cognitive science and my training in anthropology and evolutionary psychology, but also from 25 years of working in indigenous communities. That, of course, biases me in a particular way um, whenever I think about questions about morality. I return to my own experience in the United States, but also in the communities I've worked in in South America. Those are just two particular perspectives that I happen to have on questions about what morality is. Um, they may you know, bias my research, but I think they also inform it in particular ways that help me to design these studies and ask the questions that I ask. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna talk about today, first, very briefly to talk about the question of what is morality, something I think that there's still lots of room to, to talk about what the answer to this question is and what do we mean by moral differences. Um, I'll give very briefly, um, almost barely even a summary of the picture from cognitive science about a particular kind of question and this question that I have in the title of my talk which is the question of mind mindedness. And what I mean by that is to what extent do our moral judgments about others hinge upon what we think about their minds, about what they know, what they intend, what their motivations are, and so on. And the picture from cognitive science, largely in the West, is that morality is deeply mind-minded. Um, that in, when we make moral judgments about others, they typically hinge on our judgments about why they did what they did. And often those are judgments about their mental states. Um, then I'll complicate the picture a little bit with some cross-cultural data that suggests that there's variation in how and whether minds matter. This sets up the kind of puzzle that I'm gonna be talking about today. And then I'm gonna go into some new territory about the question of how do we theorize variation in mind-mindedness? And I'll present a couple different approaches, which I think are just tiny, tiny parts of the space of possibilities of how we could theorize this. And I'll present some very preliminary data from two studies in the Geography of Philosophy project that are trying to answer the question of what explains variation, but not very successfully, as unfortunately you'll see. <clears throat> and I hope that you know after this talk, maybe some of you will have a look at some of these data and have a look at some of these ideas and 
come up with ideas of your own that'll help us and help me and, and, and the community in general try to understand this question. Um, and then I'll finish with a few implications for cognitive science and cognitive development. So this question of what is morality and what do we mean by moral differences? Um, you know, here, here's a picture uh, from the now famous or infamous um, invasion of the Capitol on January 6th um, after the election of, of Joe Biden in the United States. And I think that, you know, as cognitive scientists, as social scientists, we can understand that when we talk about morality, um, we don't mean something like what is morally right or wrong. We mean what is morality, what is moral judgment? Um, is, there such, is there a category of, of, of the moral? Um, and if so, what, what is it? Um, one thing that we know for sure, well, one thing that I think we can say pretty, pretty confidently about, about this particular event is that people moralized it quite a bit. And you had different parties entering into this situation, all of whom thought that, that had very strong ideas about right or wrong, right? There are people who thought that what they were doing was very right and that what other people were doing was very wrong. And there were people in this building, in this particular space, who had opposite views of what was right and wrong. So confidently, right, that they're willing to kill people um, in the pursuit of, of, those, of those views. That, to me, is, is, is part of what I mean by this puzzle of morality. Like, this, this, these differences between us are in some ways the endpoints of cognitive development in the moral domain. And this is something that um, we need to understand. And these are um, these moral differences are things that actually matter. They're consequential. They're matters of life and death. They're, mat they're matters of deep emotion. Um, they're matters that structure the world as we see it today. Um, and so this is important stuff. And it's important that we think about it carefully and that we get it right. Um, that doesn't really answer the question of what morality is. But it does suggest um, that uh, it's, there are important questions here. Now, the question of what we mean by moral differences is a tough one. Um, you know, we, can, we can gloss this as moral judgment is more or less people's feelings about what's right and wrong. If we look to the literature, the different literatures about what explains people's moral sentiments, you, know, you get very different answers from philosophers, psychologists, and anthropologists. I'm not really going to review all this because that would take forever and be a very, a very long talk. Um, but the fact that there's so much difference of opinion you know, is here is cause, is cause for concern. So we can have different theories about this, but those of us in this room and people working in the cognitive sciences, we can actually gather data about this that we can use to answer these questions. Um, unfortunately, there's still not as much data as we might like to be able to answer consequences, uh, questions that are this consequential. Um, and so a few things that I'm gonna talk about today are things like, are moral, moral judgments judgments about a person? Are they person perception judgments, like I think you're a bad person or a good person? Are they judgments about an act? Are they judgments about something else? Are they judgments about outcomes? Are they judgments about harms independent of the reasons why people did those harms? These are things that are debated that I'll be talking about. Um, and then this question of moral differences, we still don't know the answer to these questions. A, a, very, a very common kind of pr um, perspective on this, and this is actually very popular in evolutionary psychology, is to think about moral psychology as just a version of group psychology. So it's something like, well, I'm in the blue group, and you're in the red group, and what's good for me as a blue person is what's bad for you as a red person, and what's good for you as a red person is bad for me as a blue person and therefore I just think everything you do is bad and everything I do is good, and moral judgment is kind of symmetric in that way and it's just about the interests of groups and people. At some level that has to be true, or part of that, part of the story, but that also has, it seems to be um, quite simplistic when you look at the kinds of things that people are disagreeing about between these moral groups, like what we see going on in the polit political situation in the United States and Hungary and other countries. Um, are there, are there different values, different norms, different beliefs, maybe even different ontologies, you know, representations of how reality works? Um, and, you know, there may also be some cases that, um, that w there may be some explanations for some of the data that I'm gonna show you that could even come down to something as simple as different perceptions of the facts or different representations of the facts. Where people, so the question here is, you know, if everyone agreed on what the facts were, would there be moral agreement? Is the disagreement simply, well, 
no, I think this is what really happened. You think that's what really happened, but we actually have the same moral principles. We just disagree about what actually happened. That's one possibility. Or do we actually agree on everything about what happened, but we have different values about it, about what to be done? Um, are there, and this question of ontology, could there even be different kinds of beliefs about, uh, you know, things like how, how the world works and, and, you know, what the social categories in the world are and things like that? Okay, so um, these, are, these are the questions that, these are big questions that we need to answer that um, we'll try. So um, very briefly, um, I, I want to just talk about one tiny piece of the picture from cognitive science. This is not the whole picture, but this is now honing in on the particular question of mind-mindedness that I want to talk about today. Um, and so what we, what we see uh, um, a, a, a fair amount of research in cognitive science showing is that minds matter. So, my, my judgment about you as another person, morally, hinges on what I think you were trying to do when you were doing it, or not trying to do, right? So, mentalizing in some way. I'm not gonna review this um, literature very much, I'll just give you an example so you can see the kinds of studies that I'm talking about. This is just an example of a study by Leanne Young and Rebecca Sachs that looks at, um, and, and so, the. And I'm going to be talking about research that uses vignette type studies as well. So this is a very complicated factorial design for a vignette study. But you can see there on the left, there's a harm scenario that goes something like this. Imagine your cousin is coming over for dinner. And then there's variation, there's factorial variation in the different vignettes people would get. So in one case, the character knows, for example, that this guest is allergic to peanuts. In another case, they don't know that they're allergic to peanuts. Maybe they believe they're allergic to peanuts. The character in the story decides to add peanuts to the dish because you know they really bring out the flavor or whatever. That's I don't know. That's what they used in this scenario, right? And so you can see here the version, an intentional versus accidental version of the harm would be if you know your cousin is allergic to peanuts and you put peanuts in the food and serve them to your cousin, right? You have knowledge. I mean, what we can whether whether what the intentions here are is, is not totally clear, but we do know that this is knowingly exposing this person to something that could harm them, right? Versus the case where you have no idea that they're allergic to peanuts and you serve them, you know, maybe your intentions are good. Oh, peanuts are delicious, this will make the food better. You have no idea that, you're, um, that you might harm them. And then you have an outcome, and in these studies you'll see we can vary what the outcome is. Maybe the person gets sick, maybe they don't get sick. And then the question is, what are the factors that determine you know, by manipulating these factors, how can we determine, how can we manipulate people's judgments about whether it was right or wrong to put peanuts in the food, whether you should be blamed or not blamed, um, whether you should be punished, and so on. And often, this study by uh, Rebecca and Leanne also varied these domain, what we might call the domains of, of the moral act. So here's one that involves what we might call harm, physical harm, the person might get sick or die. Um, there's also, they use this case of incest. Um, we could argue about whether there was a harm here or not, but this is another very different kind of domain where there's some kind of moral rule potentially that's being violated about having sex with a relative, and then you can also imagine cases where you can see there's cases where you might know that you're doing that or you might not know that you're doing that. And then the question is, how do I judge? We get a, a group of participants, and then we ask them, you know, is what the person did right or wrong? How right, how right or wrong is it? How much should they be blamed or, or rewarded and so on? Um, and one of the, th and I'm just showing this one study and there's many, um, but one of the things that you see, this is kind of a typical result, is that these intentional versions of doing all these different things, um, generally these are American participants, um, college students, uh, you know, they're viewed as bad if you do this on purpose. And then there's more variation in the accidental scenarios. But in some cases, in this particular case here, doing this thing accidentally, um, like serving peanuts to the allergic person, if the host didn't know that the guest was allergic, it almost completely eliminates the moral blame in this case. But we'll see that that's quite variable. Sometimes that's true, sometimes it's not. Um, in some of these other cases, like the incest, um, here's a so-called food taboo, like eating some kind of um, food that's prescribed, like in this case it's dog meat, whether you know or don't know that that's what you're eating. Um, in this case, in the American college student um, population, the, the blame 
or the wrongdoing is, is, is less when you do that by accident, but it's, the, the accidental nature of it is less mitigating for these particular kinds of wrongs than it was for the physical harm. This is one of the things that needs to be, this has actually been replicated a bunch of times, and I'll show you some of my own data that replicate this kind of thing across cultures, and we still don't completely understand the reasons for this. But this is to give you an example, right? So now we know, that, and there's, there's other studies like this from typically you know, American or European college students that show this pattern that no matter how you slice it, the different, you know, these scenarios on the left and right, all of them hold the outcome constant, like the person either got sick or they didn't. The only thing that varies between these is did the host know that there was an allergy or not? And we see that there's mind-mindedness here because you get blamed more if you knew it as the host than if you didn't know it, right? No matter what, even though the harm to the guest is the same in both of those situations. So this is the kind of design I have been using along with my collaborators in these studies and many other people use these. And so the puzzle then is to explain, first to look at are there variations here? What are the variations? Um, what are the factors that, uh, you know, that um, correlate with the variation? Are, there, are they cultural? Are they, here you just have um, contextual factors, domains that differ. What explains it? That's what we're trying to do. So the cross-cultural picture. <clears throat> um, in, so this was published in 2016, but these data were much older. This is part of the Culture in the Mind project that, that George was mentioning, um, run out of the University of Sheffield. Um, uh, the PI on this project was Steve Lawrence in the philosophy department at University of Sheffield. Um, and we got a bunch of researchers together that work in different places in the world, um, including here you can see uh, the Schwar field site that was data that I gathered along with my students, and then there are many other sites as well. Um, Storznitsa is in Ukraine. I'll mention that in a moment. Those are data connect, collected by Martin Konofsky. Um, and, and a lot, lot more sites um, in, the, in the global south. Um, one thing I'll mention here that I'll return to at the end is that um, this is kind of typical of many cross-cultural studies these days where we had a fair number of sites. Why do we have these sites? It's essentially a convenience sample, a social convenience sample, right? Um, of these are people that we knew or that we invited that were willing to participate, uh, researchers who were willing to participate, and that in some way determines what groups of participants get included in the study. Um, that's, an, that's an interesting area for innovation, I think, in cognitive science is to be more systematic about he, how these places are sampled, um, but that's also hard to do. So I'll return to that at the end. This is the, this is the group of societies that we had. And so what we did was exactly very similar to what uh, Leanne Young and Rebecca Sachs did with less manipulation of all these different factors than they did because we don't have access to quite as large sample sizes. And so doing those really complex factorial designs is a little more difficult. Um, but we had 10 different societies and we looked at four different domains. Physical harm, a man striking another man on purpose or by accident a poisoning scenario where a man poisons a village well on, pur pur on purpose or by accident. Now, I'm just using these as labels. Um, there's actually things that vary across these. So both of those are actually physical harm. One thing that differs between the poisoning and what we're calling physical harm, which really you might call battery, um, is in the poisoning scenario, lots of people were harmed. And in the battery scenario, it's just one person getting hit. There's also theft. Uh, someone taking someone else's bag on purpose or by accident, that was, a, that was relatively minor in terms of the harm because, you know, it's, it's somebody's groceries get stolen or something. Um, and then we also have a food taboo, which is very similar to what Rebecca and Leanne did in that study where we determined in that particular location what would be a food that people would consider unacceptable to eat, uh, like dog. Um, I think in Schwar we used uh, an anteater, which is something that you wouldn't want to eat, and so on. And then Somebody comes into someone's house, they're served this, they either know or don't know what it is, and they eat it. And then we ask them a variety of questions about it. Um, I'll, I'll, and then, okay, so the questions are from very good to very bad. I'll come back to that mediating factors in a second. And we ask, in this particular study, three DVs. How bad or good was what they did? We have a symmetrical scale, so we're not pushing it towards bad. We actually, and I'll show you some interesting data where in some of these cases people said in one culture said something was good to do, where in another culture they said the same thing was bad to do. 
Um, how much should they be punished or rewarded? Again, also symmetrical in terms of the valence. And how well or poorly will other people think of this person? That's the reputation question. Also symmetrical, good or bad. Um, and each of those on a five-point scale, um, basically we do this in places by saying, first is it good, bad, or neutral? Then if they say good, we say, well, a little bit good or very good, and that we can get a five-point scale out of that. So we don't actually use numbers in these places. Um, and then that third item from the bottom there, mitigating factors, I'll talk about in a minute, which is we just focused, we had one uh, block where we just had the striking another person situation, but then we varied the reasons why one person hit the other person. Things like self-defense. Um, and we looked, and th those, I'll show you those data in a second. Okay, so uh, basically, the, here's the text you can read, but here's just one example. The poisoning intentional versus accidental scenario. Basically, what we manipulated here is, um, these are factorial designs, so everything is the same. There's two men, A and B, they live in a place where most people get their water from either a well or a stream, depending on what was most appropriate for the community. Here we consult with our community partners to see what makes most sense in the local context. And so the relevant thing for the intentional scenario is person A pours poisonous insecticide into the water, even though A knew that there were instructions on the insecticide bottle that said warning poison, he poured it into it anyway, into the water anyway. Many people got sick. And then the accidental situation, everything's the same except the reasons why A is doing it, the knowledge state of A. So in this case, A wanted to kill the mosquitoes that bred in the swamp. He poured this bottle into the water that fed into the water. He believed that it was not harmful to people because the merchant he bought it from said it was not harmful. So he actually thought that he was helping by doing this. Right? So the knowledge state is different, but the outcome is the same here. And then the question is, how, I mean, you could think about it for yourself. How would you judge the actions of these two people in terms of like, what, what they did, whether what they did was wrong or right, whether they should be punished or not. This is just one example of, of many. And here's what we find. I'll show you first pooling across these different scenarios. This is the pattern that some people have made quite a bit about, including we did in this paper. <laughs> um, the top shows basically what you do is you, this is the different scores between the accidental and intentional versions of the same act. And um, on these three, with these three DVs, how bad was it? How much should they be punished or rewarded? How well or poorly will people think of them? Um, and the um, higher up on this y-axis scale is the negative part of the scale. So what you can see is there's variation where in some places, um, this is in Fiji, Yasawa Island in Fiji. These are um, Himba communities in Namibia, Hadza communities in Tanzania, all the way over to, um, these are people that we surveyed on the Venice boardwalk in Los Angeles, so they're not college students, it's a community sample that we stopped on the boardwalk and asked them to participate in this survey. Um, and then these are um, people from the village of Storznitsa in Ukraine on, on, the, on this right-hand side, where on this side of the graph, on the right, you can see communities that made a big difference between accidental and um, intentional wrongdoing, where the accidental was much worse in general. I mean, the intentional was much worse in general than the accidental. All the way over to the left, the Asawa, Hinza, Himba, and Hadza communities, where there was relatively little difference in the moral judgments between the intentional and the accidental act. Then the bottom shows the same data graphed in a different way with you know, high intent means intentional and low intent is accidental. And so you can see another pattern here, which is that for Hadza and Himba communities, for example, the judgment, they judge these things very badly in general. They have their, they're very judgy. And um, they judge them, you know, the bad that you do the bad, these are bad whether you do it on purpose or not. Right? So they're not just neutral. Um, in the middle, so communities like Schwar communities where I work, you see you know, essentially it's twice as bad, more or less on this scale, to do something uh, on purpose than it is to do it by accident. They're both bad, but it's much worse to do it intentionally. And then if you look at LA and Storznitsa, you see that actually um, the, 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 the strength of the bad judgments is, is weaker than it is on the left. Um, but you also see that the accidental cases are almost entirely mitigating of the, of the wrongdoing. Like if you do it by accident, it's basically like neutral. So there's interesting variation here, and the question is how do we explain this? Let me show you now a little bit of the breakdown by, by scenario. So this is on top pooled across um, the different societies, but shows also a kind of pattern, like a domain-specific pattern that we see. 
Remember, the poisoning scenario is a big harm. Lots of people are harmed. And here, it, across the societies in general, you see there's lots of negative judgment about poisoning, whether you did it on purpose or not. But there is an effect of intentionality. Um, if you look over on the right, the food taboo, the far right pair of uh, bars here, you also see that, in some sense, intentions don't matter as much. Eating the dog on purpose or by accident, there's not a big difference there across the societies, but it's also not a, such a big deal to do this, right? Um, so this is like kind of not really, in most places, judged. You're not judged very much for doing this, and it doesn't matter as much whether you do it on purpose or not. For a well poisoning around the world, it's very bad to do it. <laughs> And people also say doing it by accident is pretty bad in general. And then these intermediate cases, you know, theft, it, it actually, you know, someone loses something, but it's not that much. Getting hit in the face also is not great, but it's also not a giant harm compared to the poisoning. And there, you see the biggest effect in general when we pull the data of intentional versus accidental. Um, and I just put this here on the bottom, victim outcome and victim reaction, to show that this is kind of a, 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 a manipulation check to show that people do understand that the outcomes are the same. So they're, so they're judging these things. So the effects that we're seeing on the top have to do with not the effect you know, on the person who's, who's harmed, but um, it has to do with the mental states, or the reasons for action, at least. OK. Um, and then you can even go into a more complicated chart where you break down the intent conditions by society. So this is three-way interactions between society, domain, and intention condition. And so, you know, you can see interesting things here. Um, you know, for Hadza and Himba communities, as I, I mentioned, um, all of the, they, they tended to use the scale in a more extreme way than some other communities. So they were, they, they had more extreme bad moral judgments of these actions than other communities tended to. The reason I'm mentioning that is there's some potential for ceiling effects here, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and um, when you look at, so LA is this one here. I don't know if you can see my laser pointer. Second from right on the top. And Storznitsa in Ukraine is second from left on the bottom. These are the two in our sample that, that were kind of the most distinguishing between accidental and intentional harms. And you can see these patterns where, um, you know, they, people in Ukraine and LA do make a big deal about theft, for example, whether it, you knew that you were taking someone else's bag versus you're in the market and you grab a bag, you think it's yours, but it's actually somebody else's. That accidental case in, in Ukraine and the US, people are like, yeah, you basically didn't really do anything wrong or almost nothing wrong. Um, and we'll talk about this. I'm going to get to this in a second. The studies that we're doing now have to do with when do you blame people for not knowing what they should have known, right? Because you might say about the well poisoning case or about theft or any of these cases, well, yeah, I understand that you took the bag and you thought it was yours and it wasn't yours, but you shouldn't have done that. You should have checked to make sure that it was yours. So we'll get to that at the end, that it might be even more complicated, this question of, like, what is your responsibility to know what you're doing, even if you don't know? Negligence and recklessness are the legal concepts that we use there. Okay, so lots of patterns to describe here, lots of patterns to explain. What are the explanations? We have a few possibilities but the rest of the talk is going to be talking about trying to figure out what's going on. Oh, yeah. Okay, so mitigating factors. Here's another cool thing. Um, here we're kind of looking at legal defenses and, and kind of these are intuitive but also legal things. So, like, if, you, if someone is attacking you and you punch them in the face, right, yes, you've struck them in the face. Yes, you might have break their jaw or their nose or whatever, but they were attacking you, right? Is that the same as just walking up to somebody else and punching them? Um, so we vary this. We have one scenario, intentional physical harm, where one guy just walks up to another guy and hits him in the face. We don't really say why, but it's clear that it's intentional. And then we contrast that with other cases. Um, Self-defense, necessity, you harm someone for a greater good, right? Like somebody's standing in the way of a bucket, it's really loud, you have to push them or strike them in some way to get to a bucket to put out a fire, that's necessity. The insanity defense or mental illness defense, the perpetrator has a history of mental illness. Mistake of fact, we had a case where someone, there's two people that appear to be fighting. Someone goes in and hits what they think is the aggressor in the fight, but they were just playing. So it's a mistake of fact. Does that mitigate it? And then 
different moral beliefs. There's lots of ways you can manipulate this. This turned out to be not very good, but we, we had one where the, per, the person doing the striking holds the belief that hitting the other person is somehow toughening them up, and in that, their culture, that's like a good thing to do, to make somebody tougher by, by hitting them. You could imagine a belief like that. Here's what we find. This is pre pretty interesting. So here, the, these shades of purple show these different ranges of, um, basically these are ordered um, by the sort of degree of difference across these, these different um, types of mitigating factor. And so in some places, so here's, here's a couple things I'll just point out to you. It's a complicated graph, but you remember that in the earlier graph, there were some places, in particular like Fiji, Yasawa, uh, Hadza, and Himba, where we saw very little differentiation based on intentional state. But here what we find is that in every place, self-defense and necessity have a huge effect on people's moral judgments about striking another person, right? And arguably, that's evidence that, you know, depending on how you think about this, the act is the same, but your reasons are different, your mental states were different. And so we have evidence that everywhere all these societies do in some cases use mind-mindedness in making their moral judgments. So even in a place like Fiji, which had very little differentiation across many of the scenarios, self-defense and necessity, these two bars on the right, almost make the act neutral. Um, similarly, in many communities like this, Hadza, Chimane, this is indigenous communities in Bolivia, um, Susurunga in uh, New Ireland, um, all these places, self-defense and necessity matters. And I'll mention, you know, this is particularly interesting, Ukrainians, or at least this sample of Ukrainians, actually believe that defending yourself turns an act from morally bad into morally good, which is an interesting thing to think about, right? So defending yourself actually has a positive moral valence in this particular community. So you, this is interesting where we see some similarities. There are some kinds of mitigating factors that would hold everywhere, but there's also some variation. Um, you know, in Shuar communities, for example, so look at Yasawa in the middle, Inten you know, intentional battery, mistake of fact, and insanity, almost no difference. For Schwar communities, LA, and Ukrainians, big differences between those. Um, so there's differences there. And then this moral valence thing is also interesting. In some places, things like self-defense and necessity just neutralize the act morally. They make you sort of a neutral moral actor. In some places, it actually is good to defend yourself. You become a good person by defending yourself. Or a good person, the necessity case, you become a good person by committing a small harm to achieve a greater good, like punching somebody to get to a bucket to put out a fire. In some places, that makes you a good moral actor. So that's moral diversity, and then we can ask, what's going on there? Are these different norms? Are these different val cultural values? Is it possible that people are appraising these situations differently in the different places? A little hard to say, but something we need to deal with. Okay, so let's talk about what might explain these things. A um, couple papers came out recently that engage in a debate about different reasons for some of the possible different reasons for variation in mind-mindedness. Now, you might notice that I'm a co-author in both of these papers, and they disagree with each other. So that's my role as an anthropologist. I don't even agree with myself. Um, the, uh, so this, the, the authors on this paper, this was done by um, Cami Curtin, um, at Harvard um, and, and Joe Henrik, reanalyzing the same data set that I just showed you, but adding some different covariates into the data set. And then this is a paper that I did with Rebecca Sachs that's a, more of a theory paper, an opinion piece, that tries to complicate the picture a bit. So they're really not necessarily disagreeing with each other per se. The first paper actually has data. Rebecca and I don't have any data, except we have historical data and things like that. But um, trying to open up this question of what might explain variation. So there's an interesting proposal that Cami Curtin makes, um, which is, uh, and um, Rebecca Sachs and I call this kind of explanation a cultural main effect explanation. And what we mean by that, so when we say main effect, we're thinking of it in a statistical way, right? That if you think about culture, cultures as a variable, that there's a main effect of culture that explains, like some cultures are just more mind-minded than others. That's one possible cultural main effect. 
you know, the, the, the kinds of things that we're talking about um, that, that are also mentioned in the literature, like collectivism um, versus individualism, if there are big differences in that, in that, um, that would be also a cultural main effect. Some societies are more collectivist than others, according to that theory, and that you could sort of rank them and you would see overall differences in something. Um, so in this case, there's a couple possibilities that are, meant, that, that are mentioned in this uh, paper, Curtin et al. Um, one that anthropologists have mentioned, and this is something that needs further research, is um, there's an idea that in some places, beliefs about knowing the mind vary. And so um, there's a claim in particular, um, Robbins and Rumsey have made this claim about some communities in the Pacific that they have mental opacity doctrine or mental opacity uh, ideology or norm or value, which is the idea that you know, it's not really possible to know what someone else is thinking. Right? Um, and according to them, this means that in certain contexts, including both moral judgment but also pragmatics and communication, people minimize the degree to which they make inferences about the intentions and knowledge states of another individual. It's interesting to think about this proposal uh, you know, from the perspective of somebody like Dan Sperber, right, relevance theory. If you're not thinking about the intentions of another person when they're speaking to you, how can you understand what they're saying? Um, there's an interesting proposal here in literature in, in another domain, communication, right? In morality, it would suggest, well, maybe you don't, maybe you refrain from thinking about what a person's intentions were when making a moral judgment. In that case, you might have to simply have recourse to the outcomes of the action. And a, a simple kind of view of that would be, well then, in those places, people should judge the knowing peanut poisoning versus the unknowing peanut poisoning scenarios basically the same way, because you can't know if the host knew or didn't know that the person was allergic to peanuts. That's one possibility that's mentioned in this paper. Another one that the paper actually uses data to look at is kinship intensity. And so the idea here that, 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 that um, Cami Curtin has proposed is that um, you know, kinship intensity means that there's some places where um, your identity is much more deeply entangled with your kin group than in other, that, that's a high in kinship intensity group. Low in kinship intensity groups or societies are places where there's more individualism about what your identity is. Like we all understand you have brothers and sisters and so on, but in kinship intensive societies, the idea is, you know, when you do something, it reflects deeply on your family, for example. Um, and so a brother striking someone in the face, the blame for that might also come down on the siblings and the rest of the family. And this is actually something that's described a lot in the anthropological literature. Um, and they, they suggest, well, this could reduce mind-mindedness in moral judgment because basically what you would do is just look at what is, who is the person who did the damage and then say they're responsible, you know, they did it and then also extend collective guilt in some way. Um, in, it, I, and I encourage you to read this paper. I mean, the suggestion is something like that moral judgment in these places that have high kinship intensity, the function of it is less triangulating on the moral characteristics of individuals and more deciding how to assign punishment and blame. Um, I'll return to that in a second because I actually think that those might be two different things going on. One is our moral evaluation of, of the character of individuals and another is justice, deciding what to do about it. And I actually think those come apart and we know they come apart, for example, in, in American and European legal systems. But those are possible explanations. And then there's, a ton, there, and there's a many possible cultural main effects explanations. These are just two that are mentioned in this paper. Lots of culture by context possibilities too. Um, and so what we, what we saw in the data is that there is, you know, when you look at those three-way interactions, there's a lot of different interactions between culture. Even though you can find these main effects in the first graph that I showed you, when you break it down, everywhere we found some cases where people make distinctions based on mental states. And then there's a question of, well, why would they, in Fiji, why would they accept necessity or self-defense as being mitigating of, of, of wrongdoing, but not make a distinction between these other categories? Those are kind of culture by context possibilities. Okay. Um, and so one of the things that we thought about is, well, some actions might be worse in some places than others. So when we looked at those graphs, we realized, well, the well poisoning, some of the harsh judgments about well poisoning are in places where people actually get their water from scarce water sources where if you mess up a well in the middle of the desert, that might be a much worse moral act than messing up, you know, messing up a water source, say, 
you know, in a city where it can be easily uh, fixed or something like that. Um, if so, that's a, that's a very different kind of explanation, right? That, that's not about necessarily different values or norms per se, although I guess you could interpret it in that way. Um, it's about, you know, well, the harms are different. I'll also get to this question of who the, you know, maybe who the person in the scenario is, is different, and so some of this variation might have to do with people's willingness to judge these particular characters in the story, like we picked all men um, for a reason to keep it constant across societies, right? But that could be something that causes culture by context differences, um, and so on. Okay, I, I need to move along here. Um, and then I'll get to this question of, does morality, like something like maybe assessing character, come apart from deciding justice? Something that people in cognitive science literature like Fiery Cushman have proposed this. Um, okay, let me, before we finish, get to some, a little more data, um, and then I'll wrap up. Okay, so this idea that, some, that, you, that your judgments might not be mind-minded in some way maps onto a legal concept in the West called strict liability. And um, so um, in this paper, uh, we went in and coded in, the, in this database of cross-cultural data, uh, Cami did this, um, cases where there was evidence for some kinds of strict liability judgments, which, and what that means is that you're held responsible for causing a harm whether or not you did it on purpose. And interestingly, there's evidence that this occurs in many societies around the world. I'll get back to this in a second. Um, there's evidence in this paper, so, in the paper, we actually had the different ethnographers from these different sites do a sort of a, uh, there was various data on kinship intensity that was used to construct a kinship intensity index. And it turns out that in the societies with higher kinship intensity, as that hypothesis predicts, there's less discrimination between um, the accidental and, and intentional harms. So for example, in the theft condition, you know, on the left, these are low kinship intensity societies like Storoznitsa in Los Angeles, big differences between um, intentional and accidental theft, almost no difference um, in the high kinship intensity cases. But you see that there's also differences across these domains in poisoning and food taboo because there's relatively little difference between these in the, you know, in the different societies, the kinship intensity index has lower effect. Okay, that's a possible explanation. But there's issues with this explanation. Um, it turns out, and I'll return to this in a moment, you know, Americans blame accidents too. So this is data from Robinson and Darley in 1995 looking at um, a sample of American people's opinions about liability in this case, but how much you should be held responsible for different kinds of acts, like rape, causing damage to someone's property, and so on. Um, depending on your state of knowledge, and I'll return to this in a second. So, um, including cases of negligence, where you didn't know the harm that might happen, you didn't know whether harm might happen. Recklessness, where you knew that harm might happen, but you didn't know for sure whether it would. Um, and then actually knowing that harm would happen if you did it, and Americans make a distinction between these. But interestingly, all of these cases are accidents. And so within the category of accidents, people can blame people differently depending on their knowledge states. So it's not just, you know, not all accidents are not created equal, at least for Americans. And so we're doing new studies to try to look at this. Um, and so I'll mention here that, you know, if you look, these are papers from the legal literature that are actually asking, so strict liability is a concept in the law in, in Hungary and in the United States. There are cases where you're going to have to pay someone damages if you damage their property and there are cases where you can say, I didn't really know that that was going to happen. Like, I forgot to put a little parking brake on my car, and my car ran into your car. And you say, it's an accident, and I didn't know. You still have to pay damages in a lot of places, right? And it's called strict liability. The question there is, is that a moral judgment or not? And I think that we could argue that it might not be. It's actually a case where, you know, we might have moral judgments about those people. But the legal system or the social system is saying, um, in order to restore justice in some way, we actually have to just use the outcomes and ignore the intentions. And there, you know, things like negligence might matter. Like, even with strict liability, how much do we blend, you know, what, are there variations in what someone knows or doesn't know or takes the care to find out that causes damage accidentally to someone else? Okay, I'm running behind. So, very quickly, two new studies. These are preliminary data. I would like your help in trying to understand 
these data. Um, one of them is a study in geography philosophy we're calling supervalues. Another one is negligence versus recklessness. Very quickly, what we these are two different attempts to explain variation. Um, so supervalues, you probably know the idea of sacred values. And so the, there's an idea of, of sacred values in psychology and anthropology, which is that there are some things that there are some domains where um, wrongdoing in that domain is basically so bad that um, it doesn't really matter what your mental states would be if you cause harm. We relaxed that concept a little bit and came up with this, we called it super values, because we, really, we don't really want to necessarily take on board this idea of sacred values, but just that there might be some cases like poisoning a well in the desert. Is it a sacred value? Not sure, but it might be what we're calling a super value, something where don't do that. And we did find in, the, in, the, um, in that earlier 2016 study that some of the participants, when we asked them, when they said, you know, that people, Himba people, why is it equally bad to do this on accident? They said, well, don't, po don't put poison in the well and not know what you're doing. It's basically, they're, you know, they're, they're saying, yes, we understand that it was a mistake, but you have a duty to know, you have a duty to find out. For something as important as, as putting some substance into the community well, you have a duty to find out whether it's harmful or not before you do it, right? So here we manipulated damage to um, a religious site versus a secular site, thinking that maybe in some places the value assigned to damaging a religious, like a shrine or a church, might create a pattern of strict liability um, that it wouldn't for some other less important site. And we also did this manipulation of places with scarce and abundant water. Um, and here we used a design where we contrasted, this is something that Fiery Cushman and others have used to, to reduce the number of cells in the study, failed attempts versus bad accidents. And this is a particularly useful contrast because a failed attempt is where someone was trying to cause harm but didn't actually cause any harm. So there's nothing bad happened, but they had bad intentions. Versus bad accidents where they're, they're not trying to cause the harm, but they do. Right? So these are big contrasts. Um, I'll, I'll skip through this and show you these data. So even with super values for blame across these different, this is the, the uh, geography philosophy, various different samples. The red bars, these are box plots, are blame for bad accidents, and the blue are blame for failed attempts. So this shows that everywhere there's a huge effect of mental states, right? Because it's much worse to try something and not even cause harm with a bad mental state than it is to cause harm without a bad mental state in all these different places. And we need to do the stats on this. I haven't run the statistical models yet. This is just a visualization of the data. Um, but you, know, you, you do see that the effects are bigger in some places than others. Um, but you also don't see an obvious difference between the secular and religious sites. Um, in, the, in, a few places, in a few places, there might be some effects like this. Um, but interestingly, you see some places like here's students at the University of Rabat in Morocco where the um, failed attempts were so bad that everyone is at ceiling for the failed attempts. So there's variation, but there's no strict liability in any of these places. Um, okay, same with the plentiful and scarce water. Um, we did there. We did we, we did another scenario with um, a case where somebody has uh, different intentions about like um, a bus, like disabling the brakes on a bus because they are kind of mean to like scare the passengers as a trick versus they actually have malicious intent. Huge effects there across the cultures, even though there's no bad outcome in either case. Okay, so what does that mean? In these cases, we're finding, unlike the other study that we did, mind-mindedness everywhere when we do this. Even though we had this theory that maybe super values might mitigate this, and they might statistically, we'll see. There might be some small effect of the super values, but basically, we're finding huge mind-mindedness effects across these different places. We didn't include Fiji. Um, so, you know, there, it's possible that we're not capturing the variation. Last study that I'll mention, this is very new data, and I want to thank Nye, um, who's here, who's a collaborator on our project, for actually doing these visualizations a couple days ago <laughs> on data. So, we, um, remember, this is, so this is a study looking at, and then I'll wrap up, on negligence and recklessness. I'm very interested in this now. Um, this is the earlier study that I mentioned by Robinson and Darley. Even if it's an accident, your knowledge state 
your, what you know can matter for how we judge these things. So we tried to see if this might um, explain some of the variation that we see. Because remember, you know, even in the US, we saw this pattern where doing stuff on purpose is bad. We find that. A lot of the variation is in the accidents. We find that across, across the societies, right? Um, and so this, th th that's this question of like, how do we construe accidents, and when can you be blamed for an accident? So we designed a study in geography philosophy that just manipulated these two things, recklessness where you know there's a high probability of an accident, and negligence where you don't know, but you should have known. Those are the, the legal distinctions. And we want to see, are those intuitive? Robinson and Darley found that for Americans, those are intuitive distinctions. Is that true everywhere? If they are, that's a pretty subtle difference in mental states, right? Um, and here we manipulated um, the type of relationship. And the idea might be here, and the idea was supposed to be, and we'll see that this didn't pan out so well, that different relationships might have different duties of care, right? So like, if it's a stranger on the street and you don't bother to find out something that might cause them harm, you know, maybe you're gonna be blamed less than if you don't bother to find out that you're feeding peanuts to your brother who has a peanut allergy, right? There might be different duties, responsibilities. So we varied these in terms of we thought maybe the distance, social distance in the relationship. Um, and so I'll just show you and then I'll give you the data. This is the mother condition. Her son has developed a fascination with fire and has been secretly playing with matches. Um, however, so recklessness, Anna knows this, the mom knows it, but she's like, oh, it's okay, I'm, I'm gonna go in the kitchen, I'm gonna go outside and do something and leave my kid here next to the fire. Um, so that's, that's not, she's not intending harm, but she's, it's reckless. She knows that the kid might harm themselves. The negligence condition, the, the kid has, has a fascination with fire, but the mom doesn't know it. And so she's negligent, she hasn't bothered to find this out. And so these are, but in both cases we vary, maybe nothing happens in the neutral condition or the child gets burned in the bad condition. What we find here is that um, these are just three, three samples, China, Ecuador, and Morocco. This is data that's freshly come in. There are small effects of negligence and recklessness. They're not the same everywhere, but people make these distinctions between these very subtle mental states. Um, there, and the, 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 this is wrongness. Um, blame is a similar kind of story. Um, but you know, here's something that's interesting, right? These are ranked mom, employer, neighbor, stranger, kind of intuitively for us from, we would think that a mother has the highest duties of care towards her offspring. And a stranger, people who don't know each other, might have the lowest duties of, to, to not cause harm through recklessness or negligence. But we don't see this ordering um, that we thought that we might based on the type of relationship. And this is something we still need to look into. Um, we actually asked participants to rank these in terms of duties of care, and they are what we thought. You know, the duties of care to avoid harm to, another, to, to, your, to your kid is highest for a mother across these things. There's some variation here. Employers in some places are almost similar to a mom in terms of their responsibility to take to avoid harm to their employees. Um, but then neighbors and strangers have lower ones. So that doesn't predict this variation. We thought it might. Those are fresh data. Okay, so um, I got to wrap up. What does this mean? Well, every, e each of these follow-up studies, we have some evidence that everywhere we look, there's some mind-mindedness, right? The factors that we thought might mitigate, that we thought might, we might be able to use to manipulate this, like, like super values, don't seem to have the effects that we thought. Um, the cult, there's not as much cultural variation as we thought. What's going on? Um, we need to find out. So here's, here's, here's some proposals that I'll make, and then I'll, and then I'll wrap up. So I mentioned at the beginning um, that there's a, lot of, there's a lot of firepower, there's a lot of empirical firepower, money, people, time, being put towards these huge cross-cultural studies, including the things that I've just shown you. The Templeton grant was very big, and the amount of money that we spent on this was a lot. You know, we'll see if we, we find things out from this. And there are many other studies in, temp in, the, in the geography philosophy that we're doing, so we'll, we'll find stuff out. But the, here's the question, do you need 10 societies to do this? And what do you actually find out from having all these people go to these different societies? This third bullet point I'm suggesting that maybe we need, you know, it's nice that, we, that, that, that funding agencies are giving all this money to people like us to do this stuff. But my conclusion from it is we're not actually getting as much out of it in terms of what we discover, other than the variation itself. 
Um, we're not really getting bang for our buck back in the way that we should for these things. What I would suggest is that you know, a, a new mode of research that we should do, and you know, it's not like this hasn't been done before, is a more micro lens. Take fewer sites, pick them more on purpose, um, select them for more systematic reasons, and use richer materials to try to triangulate what the reasons are. Right? So something like three or four different societies that are picked not just for convenient sample reasons or because they're in different places in the world, but because they vary on some dimension that we think is theoretically relevant, and find out, does that actually affect judgments in the way that we think they might. Um, so it seems like we're pretty good at measuring, not so good at explaining. Um, I, I think that um, we might actually um, improve science if we um, scale down these studies. That's a, I didn't think I'd be arguing this 10 years ago <laughs> because there weren't these like really big, 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 large number of site cross-cultural studies when I was in graduate school. I'm, I'm so happy that there are now. I'm so happy that Templeton and NSF and other places are funding these things, and Max Planck and others. But then I, I wonder, like, maybe, you know, maybe it needs to, we need to adjust again. <clears throat> um, okay, in understanding these things, community involvement in designing research might be key in turning the corner here, right? In understanding why, these peop why people in these places are answering the way that they do. And I mentioned that, you know, the strict liability of the super values thing the idea for that partially came from the debriefing of the participants in these studies where they said things like, well, of course you shouldn't poison a well by accident. And then hearing that, you're like, well, yeah, that actually does make sense, right? Um, and then why would people, in, you know, even though it makes sense to me as an American, um, you know, why, does that, why is that the systematic judgment that people have in, say, Himba communities and not people that you stop on the Venice boardwalk? Um, and then I would say, you know, the other side of that is that cultural self-study, which is the norm in cognitive science, is, is rarely contextualized in terms of culture. I was talking to some people about this during the break. This is a huge problem with psychology journals. I mean, we already know that there's this issue with the unmarked category of research, you know, research that's mostly done with white people in the United States and in Europe, and those subject populations are generally not marked in the title or the abstract of psychology papers. They just say, you know, children are fair, three-year-olds are fair or something. What it means is like white three-year-olds from Germany are fair. Um, but that's not generally <laughs> remarked upon. And, um, you know, anthropologists have criticized this a lot because, you know, here we're studying, you know, there's Hungarian people studying Hungarian children. You have a lot of insight into why Hungarian children might be doing the things that they do in these studies. Um, Americans might have a lot of insights into, you know, the subject populations they do, but that is missing from these, um, from typical psychology studies. We could go a long way, even without cross-cultural comparison, if people, if, if editors in journals were actually willing to entertain researchers saying something about, well, this might be why we found this in this particular cultural group. Anthropology, that's normal. You don't even have to justify it, but in psychology, um, I know for a fact from having reviewed papers like this, it's, it's a well-known phenomenon that if you submit a paper that's done research on, um, adults or children in the United States or Europe, you don't have to say anything about who they were or why they responded the way they are, but if you did a study in Ecuador, if I just do a study on, on, on Schwar people and submit it to a psych journal, I will be forced to say why my results, wh why the fact that they're Schwar has something to do with the results that I found, even though Schwar people are perfectly ordinary human beings in just the same way as Hungarians are or Americans are, but in, in, in psychology, you have to justify one and not the other. And that could be something that we could change um, in cognitive science and psychology. And people here who are editors and reviewers on papers could help doing that by pushing back when you see this, thing go, this kind of thing going on, which I, I do see and I do push back on it. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention on that is that, you know, we still don't know, and I'm, you know, this is in my court to try to do as an anthropologist, we have yet to figure out a really good way to combine qualitative methods like ethnography, history, and so on with quantitative methods. I mean, the way that we do it is the way that I've been showing you, is like we come up with some kind of scale. And that's one way to do it, but then you try to correlate some kind of scale with dimensions of variation. Um, that's, you know, that's really low resolution compared to what we know, compared to methods that we have um, in ethnography and anthropology. And how, how do you do this? How do you, how do you make it such that ethnographic observations can then be entered into a cross-cultural study in a way that allow us to draw more than just sort of 
post hoc conclusions. I'm not sure, and that's something that I think we need innovation for. So here's room for innovation, note to younger generation, note to people here who could do something differently. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, but you know, I may be over the hill already too much to try to actually do this kind of stuff, but I'm doing what I can. Um, I know I went over time. I want to thank everyone. Um, thanks to Rachel and Esther again for inviting me. Thanks to the funders. Um, thanks to the collaborators around the world, my students and postdocs. I really want to thank the Schwar, Achuar, and Shiviere communities who have hosted my research, who have led, who have helped me reach some of these insights about culture. And I also want to thank um, Nye, who's here, for the last minute data visualization. And thanks to you all for listening. We have time questions. for five questions. Thank you very much. Sorry for going over. Yeah. So I know, I know you asked for help in explaining yeah. this. Yeah. I'm just going to add to confusion. Good. So the, your last uh, results on like degree of responsibility to yeah. care, take care about someone. Yeah. So there is, I think this, uh, parents here will confirm this, there is this common intuition about kids that like with your own kid, you can do more risky stuff than with the kids of others. Yeah. And like nannies or in daycare, they will be more careful about certain things than you would as a parent. And this has always puzzled me because in principle, like it's, <laughs> it's your kid, you should, yeah. you should be more careful. But it's the opposite. And I myself have this intuition that if there is another kid and my, who is not my child, in my care, I would be more careful doing like risky stuff than yeah. just with my own kid. And I have no idea why is that. So like rationally, I have, it puzzles me, but I have this, the same intuition. So here's some more confusion. You have no idea or maybe you have some idea? I don't know, why is that? <laughs> like somehow I'm like, you know, I would, f yeah, I don't know. I would feel bad and like. That's really interesting. No, I mean that, Thank you. I mean, I think, I mean, if you look at this, right, it's like um, moms are definitely among the highest rated in terms of the obligations for care. But yeah, then we go back to these blame things and they're, you know, in some cases, lowest amount of blame for negligence, negligence and recklessness. Versus other kids. Thank you. Okay, that's a great idea. Own kids versus other kids. That is a good contextual comparison. Yep. Yep. So this is, this is an example of an exploratory thing where some of us had a hunch that the relationship might matter, and then we picked these. We also had in the pilot doctor, which is, so there's very special categories, right? Like doctors, what is the duty of care of a doctor? Um, it's high, right? But is it higher than a mom? I don't know. So we kind of thought that these would be, and we were right about the ranking. We were right about, um, we were right about this, pretty much. The ordering was what we thought it was, or the subject participants said that it was like this, but we were wrong about the blame. And so, yeah, I'm not sure. Thank you. But that's, that's the kind of comparison that we need, is to just vary that one thing. Yeah. Thanks. Unfortunately, we have time for one more question. Okay. So, go. Sorry, I talked too much. I have to make a decision. <laughs> so, I was curious. Uh, especially on some of the moral judgment stuff. Hello, back here. Where are you? Oh, hi. Uh, especially on some of the moral judgment stuff, do you see any difference in cultures depending on how, uh, how consequences are, or how, com basically what the sort of just structure of a justice system is in that society? So whether it's something that's actually operated by the community or if there's an actual like authority that yes. administers this stuff. And whether that, is that a dimension that would be relevant to consider in terms of how people think about assigning blame or consequences? Thank you for the question. Um, so that goes back to what, that, thank you. I, I, I think that it probably does almost certainly make a difference whether there's just community-based justice. Um, and, and even there, there's, there, there's, um, there's, there's variations, right? So in, in, the, in the case of Schwar communities, for example, there's a legal system, so you know, if someone gets murdered, or there's very other, various other kinds of things that would be considered crimes by the state, and then the person is gonna go to a court in Ecuador. There's other kinds of things where 
the community will decide. And then even with sort of community justice, if we want to call it that, there are some places like in Fiji and Yasawa where Joe Henrik works, where there's chiefs that decide. Um, and then in, 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 in Shuar communities, there, is, there are no chiefs. There never have been. Um, it's not hierarchical in that way. It's, and so the community gets together and decides on a punishment. Of course, there are, there are differences in how influential different people are, like you know, senior adults are gonna be more influential in the decision. But yeah, then, then you're right. Then, then you would think that certainly for decisions about justice, what should happen to the person, it, it would matter. But then I, I, my question for you and, and, for, and for me is like, how does the presence of institutional punishment affect my moral judgments? I'm not entirely sure, right? Because you could imagine it going, you know, kind of either way, um, where you might say, well, we know lots of cases in the American legal system where people get away with stuff, like inciting a riot on the Capitol, where you might know, <laughs> this is my personal opinion, you might have a very strong opinion about personal culpability in that case, but the law and the, 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 you know, the necessity to prove mens rea and maybe the cowardice of, you know, Congress or something like that, you know, may mean that the person doesn't come to justice, which is a separate kind of thing than, you know, my moral judgments about that person. So I think it's a really interesting question. Like, does, does the presence of institutional punishment, does, does that shape people's moral judgments and which way does it shape them? Does it, does it kind of relieve the, the necessity for interpersonal moral judgment? Does it increase it? I'm not sure. It's a great question, though. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And we now have no more questions. <laughs> Time for no more questions. Let's go for a coffee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. for your nice presentation.